Good evening. <clears throat> when Dr. Steinmetz <clears throat> said that the nature of spiritual power would be revealed in the 20th century, it should have shaken the foundations of the entire religious world, because nothing would be more natural than to assume that the religions of the world knew all about spiritual power, because supposedly religions are based on spiritual power. And yet no one seems to have been shocked by that statement. And uh, so far as I know, no one has made the claim <clears throat> that the nature of spiritual power was well known. Actually, the reason that the nature of spiritual power has not been known as this, that spiritual power does not belong to the mind, to the intellect. There is no amount of knowledge that anyone can attain that would be spiritual power. There is no amount of knowledge that anyone could attain that would move mountains spiritually or heal disease spiritually or raise the dead or forgive the sinner. You cannot forgive the sinner by saying, I forgive you. You cannot heal the sick by pleading with God to heal the sick. You cannot multiply loaves and fishes spiritually by any means now known to the human mind. It is because of this that we know that spiritual power can only be brought into expression through the attainment of a fourth dimensional consciousness a higher awareness than that which is possessed by the human mind. In other words, <clears throat> there is no known truth that will ever function spiritually. It makes no difference what truth you study or what truth you believe you know. <clears throat> whether it is one of the more orthodox appeals to God or whether it is using the words of Jesus Christ, I say unto thee, pick up thy bed and walk, or I say unto thee, arise, or thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. Use these statements, memorize these truths, do anything you like with them and you will find that there is no spiritual power in them. Take any of the statements that have ever been given to the world by any of the modern metaphysical teachings. Learn them by heart. If you like, learn them even forwards and backwards and see if they will result in any spiritual spiritual activity, and you will find the answer is no. You will find that there are students who have studied 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 
and still haven't achieved the healing of a headache. And yet, they know all of the words in the Bible, and they know all the words in the metaphysical books. In the same way, there are great biblical scholars. Very few of them have ever attempted to perform anything of a spiritual nature with all of the knowledge that they possess. And the reason is, it isn't possible. It isn't possible to bring the least spiritual power into expression by any means now known to the intellect or to the mind. And uh, yet, any person with even a grain of spiritual attainment can do mighty works that the greatest minds could never perform. That is why the Master said that you must come as little children, not as great scholars, not as men and women who know a great deal about scripture or truth, but as a little child. It is for this reason that our work is quite a difficult one. It is the only work of its kind anywhere in the Western world where the entire goal of our work is the attaining of some measure of spiritual consciousness. Our work is not the importing of knowledge because all of the knowledge, all of the letter of truth that there is in the message of the infinite way can be imparted in any one week in the year. It would require only one week of anyone's time to learn all of the letter of truth, to learn all that we know, all that's embodied in our books. Every bit of this could be learned in one week as far as the mind, the intellect is concerned. What good it would do, I don't know. Except if an individual decided to take that knowledge and work with it, and practice it, until it served its purpose in developing the higher consciousness. In the Orient, this is quite a different story. This manner of teaching has been known in the Orient since long, long centuries before the Christian era. It is that system whereby there is a spiritual teacher, that is, one who has attained some measure, some have more and some less, of spiritual consciousness, and by sitting quietly in their cave or in their mountain place or by the river bank, gradually attract to themselves some individuals who feel drawn to them or led to them, and then these become the student body, and they will sit around with the teacher, come back each day for a session, sometimes remain for two or three or four nights and days, sleeping outdoors if necessary, until some measure of light begins to dawn in their consciousness. Other teachers have graduated from their caves and formed ashramas, 
small houses, temples, places of worship and living, and students come to them, drawn there because there is no advertising. And you have the same thing repeated. People sometimes come from thousands of miles away just to spend a week or two with a particular teacher. Usually the local students will come and remain anywhere up to five, six, seven years. Because in the Orient, in spite of radio and television, they still don't know that we think you can learn spiritual truth over a busy weekend. And so they feel that it's quite normal and natural to spend three, four, five, six, seven years with their teacher. However, <clears throat> the teacher is never imparting very much of truth because the teacher knows very little of truth. And in fact, there isn't much of truth really to impart. And so it becomes a matter of meditation, of imparting a truth here and there with which the student can work, meditate, ponder, until they attain some degree of awareness of even one particular truth. In the experience of some of these students, they reach a place that the teacher recognizes where they are ready not to live now as the disciples said, we can do all things in thy name, in other words, through your consciousness, but where they are now ready to live on their own consciousness. And usually the Oriental teacher sends the student out away from him for a year or two until the student proves that they have been able to live on their own consciousness, their own degree of attainment, and then usually they receive their title, their robe, and they in turn go out and either sit in a cave or start a small ashrama or in these modern days travel to the Western world and start teaching. All of this is aimed at one thing, the development of a higher consciousness than the normal intellect or human mind. The development of a state of consciousness which is not normal to the human being because it has never been developed in the human being although it is there. In the beginning, before what is called Adam and Eve, every individual had a fully developed spiritual consciousness. In fact, that's all they did have. They didn't have what we call mortal consciousness because they had no awareness of good and evil. They had no more awareness of good than they did of evil. They only had an awareness of being, harmonious being, joyous being, free being. There was neither Greek nor Jew. There was neither bond nor free. There was only being, pure being. And each individual drew their wisdom, their substance, their support, their life from the source, which was the divine consciousness called the Father Consciousness. The Father Consciousness is this Supreme Consciousness. The Son Consciousness is the full and complete individualization of the Father Consciousness. In other words, when an individual drew entirely from their spiritual source, 
they had that same mind that the father had and they had the fullness of it without in any wise taking away any of that their neighbor had just as your garden can have the full sunshine without depriving your neighbor's garden of any sunshine it too can have the full sunshine now <clears throat> After what is called the fall of man, after what is called the uh, departure from the Garden of Eden, the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, man has a consciousness of his own. He no longer has the father's consciousness. He now has a mortal consciousness, that is, the suffix al meaning of a consciousness of death as everyone has who is under the universal belief in two powers that very belief in two powers means life and death good and evil rich and poor pure and sinful that is the dual consciousness of the human race the mortal consciousness the consciousness of death now ever since the beginning of religion the attempt has been to get back into the garden of eden or in the language of the prodigal son who also was the son of the king the son of nobility royalty kingliness and wealth and as a son was heir to all his father had but he too entertained a sense of separation and decided to be an individual on his own account with no dependence on his source no dependence on the father but rather I me of my own self am mighty and so he departs with whatever measure of his father's substance his father gave him and remember it was divided And then every bit that he used left him with a little bit less until eventually he ran out of consciousness ran out of substance and had nothing left not even to eat and from the moment that he turned in recognition of this fact turned back to the father's house he also exemplified the place that we exist now in the human scale where we realize we have come to the end of our rope we have used up all our resources we have no way of knowing how to maintain peace on earth certainly no way of knowing how to prolong life and uh, we're ready to acknowledge those that are in the father's house even if they're servants there are a lot better off than we are facing tomorrow's headline and I think I'd like to rush back to that father's house and get in under the umbrella of divine consciousness because this place we've brought ourselves to could hardly be called beside the still waters and in the green pastures the attempt on the part of religion always is the return to our divine state of consciousness whether as in some cases they hope to attain it 
by obedience to the Ten Commandments and the performance of certain rituals and rites and ceremonies, or whether, as in the case of other religions, they hope to attain it by asceticism, by sacrifice, by pleasing God in some way, whether, as in the case of other religions, they hope to attain it by certain practices, uh, physical, mental, all aimed at elevating consciousness to the return to the Father's house. In some forms of religious worship, it is hoped that it can be attained by service by devoting one's life to the service of other people. In every religion, then, the ultimate object and end is to return to the Father's house to be once more in spiritual consciousness or to have in you that mind which was also in Christ Jesus. There is the end and aim of Christianity. Have that mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, or return to heaven. It all means the same thing. It all means a return to our origin as divine children of God, as one with God. Now, that which brought about the very beginning of the infinite way was the discovery or revelation that man cannot attain heaven or harmony or the Father's consciousness through his mind, that he cannot learn anything anywhere that will restore him to heaven that so far as the religious history of the world is concerned, no one has ever given us a revelation of how we can return to the Father's house through learning something. In other words, nobody has given us a teaching that will return us to the Father's house. There are many teachings of how to accomplish it, but none of them have accomplished it. In the experience, if we can start there with Gautama the Buddha, we have a discovery or revelation that without sacrifices, without asceticism, but with meditation and obedience to what later has been called the golden rule, we can return to the Father's house. We can attain that Buddha mind or mind that was in Christ Jesus. And the Oriental teachings recognize this because they have not had one Christ they have had a hundred major Christs and millions of minor Christs. In other words, in all Oriental teachings, anyone, anyone who sincerely desires it can attain some measure of Buddhahood or Christhood. Anyone who sincerely desires it and is willing to undertake the program of devotion, practice, study, can attain some measure of Buddhahood, or in the Christian language, can attain some measure of that mind which was in Christ Jesus. So whether you call it the Buddha mind or the Christ mind, remember it means the enlightened mind, because both Buddha and Christ means enlightened one. Therefore, the Buddha mind is the enlightened mind. 
the Christ mind is the enlightened mind. And according to the Oriental side of the teaching, anyone sufficiently devoted can attain some measure of illumined consciousness. Now the Master followed this exactly because in his three-year ministry he made it possible for his disciples and his apostles to attain some measure of that mind, enough of a measure that they could go out without person script and still support their ministry. They could heal the sick, they could carry comfort and enlightenment wherever they went. Now they couldn't do this with teachings out of a book. They could only do this by the degree of enlightenment that they had received from or through the Master. Then the reason that the secret of spiritual power has been lost, and of course what I've tried to say to you is that the secret of spiritual power is in the attainment of some measure of this enlightened mind. Without it you have no spiritual power. No matter how much truth you know, or how much scripture you know, or how much other knowledge you know, or have, you still have no measure of that mind in Christ Jesus until you have some measure of light or illumination. The reason it was lost was in the West that with the passing of the Master, the disciples, the apostles, gradually this form of teaching went out and nothing was left but manuscripts. And it's a very difficult thing to get illumination from a manuscript, more especially if somebody has to interpret it for you. The importation of that mind that was in Christ Jesus, the illumined mind, takes place with an individual when through some act of grace within themselves the master I'm not speaking now of a man I'm neither speaking of Jesus Christ nor Buddha I'm speaking of the master the divine consciousness if that touches an individual operates in an individual Without the help of a teacher, without the help of a teaching, then it is possible for this illumination and this spiritual power to be in evidence. You will remember that in the case of Paul, who received his illumination 30 years after the crucifixion, that he had no personal teacher to bring about this spiritual transformation in him. The religious teacher that he had, Gamaliel, one of the greatest of the Hebrew teachers, had probably no degree of spiritual awareness. He was a scholar and he knew the books thoroughly. But spiritual power seems to have been completely absent. And so this Saul of Tarsus, one of the most highly trained religious scholars, one of the most highly educated of religious scholars, but without a trace of the spiritual, or he wouldn't have been out on the mission of persecuting and helping to kill Christians, this man, by inner illumination, without the help of an outside teacher, without the help of an outside teaching, he receives illumination. 
He receives it from within himself and he recognizes that it came to him as the gift of the Christ. It may well be because of his identity with the Jewish movement and uh, its history in this days of the Messiah that he attributed this Christ to the man Jesus. It may even have been that the consciousness of the man Jesus actually was there to perform this illumination just as in the case of John probably 80 or 90 years later who says that he was taught by Jesus Christ and this of course was 50 years after Jesus Christ had been crucified it may also have been that he received his teaching and illumination from the spirit of the Christ itself, or it may well have been that it was the spirit of the Christ made manifest through the individuality of Jesus that appeared to him and taught him. But at least I give you these two illustrations in Christian history of men who received their illumination without the aid of a human teacher or teaching undoubtedly due to their own inner devotion to the search for truth. We have the same experience in the life of Gautama the Buddha who went from teacher to teacher for at least seven years and some say more and seemingly received nothing from them. Of course, he must have received some bit from each one, but certainly not illumination. And it is only after he takes his departure from all the teachers and begins to draw from the resources within himself that he has the experience under the Bodhi tree of complete illumination. And here, you will notice it is not attributed to the personality of anyone. It is acknowledged by him that he had received the Buddha or state of enlightenment, but with no mention of it through an individual. There are others such in the religious world and strangely enough, each one of those of whom I have any knowledge were originators of a new religious teaching. In an absolute sense, not new, because all of them agree on one thing, that without this illumined mind, you are spiritually nothing. With this illumined mind, you are spiritually everything, and none of them seem to have any doctrines, none of them have any forms of worship, none of them have any particular teachings beyond the fact that it is necessary to attain illumination. And so to this very day in the Oriental religions, you have as the goal the attaining of Satori, enlightenment, Buddhahood, Buddhi. Whereas in the Occidental religions, you have only a call to be obedient to certain forms of worship, service, and uh, a knowledge of what's written in books with no attempt to bring about the development of spiritual illumination. So that even in some religions, you find men today of spiritual illumination. But in none of them do you find 
that this is a necessary religious step. In other words, these people who have attained it are looked upon as unusual people, rather than understanding that that is actually the normal and the expected of everybody on the spiritual path. Now, for the rest of the world, this bringing about of some degree of Buddhahood, the Buddha mind, bringing about some degree of development of that mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, has been the activity of teachers working with students. And the students, through working with certain specific truths, plus the contact with the teacher's consciousness, gradually taking on the spiritual light and spiritual power until they attain. In our experience and the work that we are doing worldwide, the attempt is to bring to the student an awakening into that mind, into the awareness, the consciousness of that mind, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, the goal is the attainment of spiritual illumination, the attainment of a mind imbued with spiritual power. Spiritual power is not a power that you can use. Spiritual power is only in action when the individual is not trying to use it. In other words, and this is an example, if you were asked for help, spiritual help, to help someone that needed it physically, mentally, morally, or financially, the only possibility of your success would be in proportion to your ability to refrain from using spiritual power, in proportion to your ability to be still physically and mentally and let spiritual power flow through you. The moment you would attempt to heal somebody spiritually, you would set up the barrier that prevents your success. The moment you would try to exercise a spiritual influence, you would be barren. It operates like this. The master is standing in the midst of a throng. He can't possibly know who's around him. And yet a woman breaks through that throng, down on the ground, remember, where he can't see her in that throng, touches the hem of his robe and is healed. Did he make any conscious attempt to heal her? He couldn't because he didn't know she was there. And if he had seen her, he wouldn't have known whether she was sick or well. He was merely standing there being himself. In other words, abiding in the consciousness, I of my own self am nothing, the Father within me is all let the Father have his way and his will, but not try to channel it, not try to say, his spirit is Mrs. Jones down here on the ground. Let's pick it off. No, no. Nowhere is there an attempt to use spiritual power. The Master says, what did hinder you? 
pick up your bed and walk. No attempt to use spiritual power just telling you that there's no power to prevent your being well. When he says to the blind man, open thy eyes, he's not using any spiritual power. He's merely saying there is no material power. You will find through your own experience that the more you try to use spiritual power, the less you'll accomplish because all you're bringing to bear is mind power, mental power, and it isn't spiritual. When you attain the ability to be still and know that I am God, not that Joel is God, I in the midst of Joel, and then be very still and let God then you'll find that spiritual power has done miracles for you or your patient or your student. You haven't, you have been still to let this happen. In our work, <clears throat> the method of teaching is th both through meditation and practice with the letter of truth. The letter of truth does not heal and it never becomes spiritual power, but it can develop spiritual power within you. And let us see how that happens, because remember that is our goal. Supposing we take a very little understood Bible passage. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. You'd be surprised what that can do in the way of developing spiritual consciousness within you by practicing it. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Now if you read that literally with your mind, and that's what has been done and that's why this passage has not worked you would believe that there is a lethal weapon, a deadly weapon, and it could prosper except that some god in some way is going to save you from this deadly weapon. That's what that passage would indicate to the mind. I have an enemy. Oh, here's a fellow with an atomic bomb. And it's deadly, and I know what it can do to me, but fortunately, God says that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper, and therefore, I am now immune, and this deadly weapon can no longer harm me, and it flies, and it does. Why does it? Because you did not know the truth that would make you free. When you attain even a measure, a tiny measure, a grain of spiritual understanding, you will know that the meaning of this is that no deadly weapon has power against you because you are life and life is God. You are eternal and immortal and God has never made anything to destroy his own immortality or eternality. You will know that you are not some specially favored person who is now going to be saved by God from a deadly enemy. But you will understand that there are no deadly weapons with power. Therefore, 
like Daniel turning his back on the lions in the den. Why? Not because he thought God had picked him out to protect from lions, but because through spiritual discernment he had recognized lions to be of God's creating. Not beasts as men thought them to be. And according to the story, they never bothered him one bit, seemed not even to know that he was in the cage. Now, if you look out at this life through your mind, you have deadly germs. You have a calendar, which is most deadly. You only have to keep looking at it for three score years and ten, and then you're due any day for extinction. And a lot of people don't even reach that. Why that calendar? Whoo, what a deadly weapon the calendar is. And there are lots of others, bullets and bombs and so many other things, we won't rehearse them. And each one of these, remember, is a deadly weapon. And each one of these, an automobile on the road, can be a very deadly weapon. Every one of these deadly weapons, yet scripture says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Now take this from the spiritual standpoint. Don't do as a man did last year when we were in California. There was a lot of flu going around, and one of the ministers one Sunday saw a lot of his people missing from the congregation and he said how foolish can you be why this can't hit me and the next Sunday he wasn't on the platform this he said this can't hit me see he had a this he had an it and it his own belief that there was a this and an it really did him in his own belief that there is a this he thought there was a deadly germ only because he had a diploma. He was clothed in his diploma and it couldn't break through. Your diploma won't save you. Your robe won't save you. Your bulletproof vest won't save you. But to understand that you are life eternal. God is your life, therefore you are immortal, spiritual. And that in the entire kingdom of God there are no deadly weapons, physical, mental, or any otherwise. And to realize this, what did hinder you? There are no powers apart from God. The mind of man that embraces two powers is not a power itself. And yet it is this very mind of man which is the deadliest weapon as long as we can be made to believe that man has a mind of his own in which there is the power of evil. If God didn't make evil, there is no evil. To be able to take that one passage of scripture, to live with it. And don't think for a moment that by hearing me voice this, or even rightly interpret this passage for you, that this alone constitutes your safety or security. No, no, no. You will then be placing your safety and security in something or somebody outside yourself. Your safety and security lies in your awareness, your spiritual discernment, that there is no weapon that can be formed that is deadly, for it is not of God. Then your ability to practice that, to meditate on it, to ponder it, 
until within you there comes, oh, whereas before I was blind, now I see. Whereas before I could agree intellectually that that was so, now I have the inner awareness, the feel of it. Then you'll find that it's literally true. That there's no weapon that can be formed that is power. Because there's only one power, and that's the immortal life which you already are. It is the divine truth which you already are. There is no life for you to attain. There is no truth for you to attain. There is only the recognition of the truth that you are the truth, and that you are life eternal, that you are the bread of life and the meat and the wine. And then the realization that the infinite nature of God makes it impossible for there be, to be a weapon that is actually deadly. Then you face the bomb, you face the bullet, you face the lion, you face the climate, you face the weather. I have feared you. And you exist only as a belief in two powers, a mortal belief in two powers, a material belief in two powers. The only existence you have is in the human mind of man. And you can't get outside of that mind to do anything to anybody. You can only destroy those who entertain that belief in two powers. Yes, it's self-destructive to the individual who insists there is a this or a that or an it. Then he himself has formed the weapon, which is a belief in his own mind. But you, once you accept through your practice of this principle, through the practice of this Bible passage, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, no human weapon, material weapon, mental weapon, physical, moral, financial, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper because ne God never made a deadly weapon. What did hinder you? There are no powers but God. And then the individual standing over there thinking he's got a bomb in his hand finds it explode there. Only in his own belief. He's the fellow standing there with the belief in two powers. That is why mental malpractice, whether it is done individually, collectively, or by universal belief, has no power whatsoever except on the malpractitioner. The malpractitioner has accepted two powers. And the moment he has, he's a victim of his own belief. You could be harmed if you agreed with him that there are two powers and started to hide behind a wall or a statement of truth. But the moment you would recognize, I am life eternal. What can destroy the immortality of life? And who created a power destructive to the life of God. You no longer have a belief in two powers, but your malpractitioner does. So as the malpractitioner sends it out and it reaches your understanding of truth, one power, all it can do is boomerang right back. And those who have accepted the belief in two powers go down under their belief. It has happened time and time again in history. The only reason this isn't so, isn't widely known, is that it has never been widely accepted that there is only one power. And therefore, practically everyone in the world 
is trying to hide behind some great big power. And that in itself is the acceptance of two powers. And that's why they suffer from it. As long as you can be made to believe that there are two powers, you can be victimized by that belief. Whether some individual tries to hand you that belief, or a group, or just the universal belief in two powers. In any way, you can be made to suffer. But if there is such a thing as an individual in this age still trying to mount practice, watch what happens to them. The moment you have perceived that God is your life, now try to destroy that, dear friend. Just try to destroy the life which is God. Or try to show me a power other than God power. See that? But if you believe that there is an evil power which your understanding will protect you from, you're lost. If you believe you have an in with God that's going to save you from some evil, you're lost. You've accepted two powers. In this work, you have to be pure. Absolutely pure. And by purity, I mean absolutely aware, 100%, that God is the only power there is. There are no other powers. Omnipotence, which means all power is spiritual. And if omnipotence is spiritual, then neither material nor mental powers can be powers. The moment you perceive that, you not only prevent the individual, the group, or the universal belief to function in your experience, but you begin to destroy it for this whole world because one with God is a majority. One with God is a majority. It is for this reason that <clears throat> where there are groups, like our groups around the world, if they have a teacher or leader to lead the meditation and to do the spiritual work, that entire group will in some measure be spared the discords and inharmonies of everyday human living. Then as two and three attain some measure of that, they commence to bring immunity to the entire group in a fuller measure, and then gradually to their household, to their neighbors, and who knows in the long run where this will end, because it is true that one with God is a majority, that where two or more are gathered together, the Christ is in, in this name, the Christ is in the midst, or ten righteous men can save a whole city. Therefore, an individual or a small group of individuals who would work even with this one passage, no weapon that is formed has power. And rest in that, they would wipe out what is called a carnal mind or mortal mind from their entire group and the families of their groups and eventually the neighborhoods of their groups the whole community. You see, working with a passage like that develops this Buddha mind because it is the mind that was in Christ Jesus that knows that there are no powers, physical or mental. The only power that exists is the power of God which is spiritual. Only an individual with that conviction has some measure of the Christ mind. And even a tiny measure, a grain of that consciousness can really do wonders. It is the same thing 
if you were to take the word omnipresence. The moment an individual works with the word omnipresence, it doesn't only mean that where I am God is. Omnipresence means all presence, so it must mean where you are God is. Now for one individual to be holding to the truth of omnipresence, meaning that where I am God is, where you are God is, where he is, where she is, where it is. That one individual becomes a law unto this whole group. And then when you wake up and find a little healing of this or a little healing of that or finally a spiritual awakening, it's because somebody has been holding you in omnipresence then as you begin to work with omnipresence, the first thing you know, you're including your household, your business, your art, your profession, your companions. Eventually, you get to be a Christian and realize that it's true about your enemies. Omnipresence has to do with your enemies, too. The place where on they stand is holy ground. But don't you see that in the light of your realization of omnipresence, even the devil could be healed. Thank you.